We have an amazing opportunity, an amazing panel for you now. Ah, that got their attention. So one of the things that we talk about when I go to meetings with the other um, executives that run the bio-industry associations from across the country, um, we have an organization called the Council of State Bioscience Executives and, and Associations and Institutes, and we have different groups that work on nonprofits and for-profits and how do we incubate and how do we bring people forward. And one theme that just kept coming up over and over and over again was the importance of working with collaboration partners. And those partners are the industry, the patient advocacy groups, and the physician scientist or physician researcher. And um, as I you know, teased Dr. Du Bois about um, earlier in his introduction, um, last April we were together with some of the CEOs from all of the biotech companies around the country and also with the chief scientific officers of companies like Pfizer and Roche and Novartis and others, and over and over and over it was two themes. You've got to get your physician scientists involved, you need to get your patient advocacy groups involved, and you need to have your company supporting them and bringing them together. So I reached out to one of my favorite patient advocates, um, Shara Sober at the Save the Cord Foundation, and I said, so, you want to help me with this? And she's like, of course, advocates are like the most excited people in the world. She's like, yeah, let's do it. Then I reached out and I said, okay, so who should we pick on? And we're like, oh, of course. We're going to pick on Tom Moore because he is the executive chairman of the Bioscience Company of the Year. So he would be the perfect example of the right kind of partnership. And of course, then we said, but that physician scientist, who's, who's the best physician scientist as an example of a wonderful program? And of course, that brought us to Dr. Miller. So ladies and gentlemen, please, as I join the panel, um, welcome Tom Moore from Cord Blood Registry, or CBR, Cheris Ober from the Save the Cord Foundation, and Dr. Joseph Miller uh, from the University of Arizona and ICE. Thank you. Okay, so, you know, we talked about the, the power and the importance of working together, and Tom, you know, CBR is the world's largest private umbilical stem cell bank. And, you know, we hear so much about the early days when, you know, it was coming out of the University of Arizona and we were struggling to pull it all together. And today, I you know, when we tour the facility and people will be able to see that facility online later because we've got the videos up. Um, it, it's just tremendous. But when we look at that journey from discovery to development to delivery, how did CVR do, do that? And, and how does in an emerging science and an emerging field like stem cells, how do these partnerships play into it? Yeah. So when we started the company, uh, and I might add, this was my daughter's idea that came out of Scientific America, and she came to me with this article, and she said, Dad, do you know that 20,000 kids die each year because they can't find a bone marrow match? Cord blood can make a difference. And I said, wow, that sounds like it would be a great company, but we knew nothing about stem cells. So we looked throughout the world, and there were six laboratories that were dealing with cord blood stem cells. And the best technology was at the University of Arizona, and that's how we ended up with our laboratory in Tucson. And today, uh, we're in 83 countries. We have um, half a million samples stored. And what we realized as we got into it, it was originally started for cancers and treatments that were handled with bone marrow. But what we started to realize in about 2005, it morphed into regenerative medicine and those samples were actually being used by those children who had problems and diseases like cerebral palsy. 
an anoxic brain injury and kids who had fallen in swimming pools and were brain dead for a period of 40 minutes or without oxygen for a period of 40 minutes. And cord blood brings those kids back. And so it's a bonus business that it's turned into. But part of that was the collaboration with the University of Arizona. And then it developed when you have 500,000 kids cord blood that's stored, it has a profile of CDC, yeah. Centers for Disease Control. And the profile of those children have about 600 kids with type 1 juvenile diabetes in those doers, and their cord blood is stored. And that may be helpful from a therapeutic standpoint to help solve and do regenerative medicine to repair the pancreas. Um, you have roughly about 9,000 kids with cerebral palsy. You have about 8,000 children with autism. And we've just launched now a trial for infant stroke. We have about six studies underway. And what it enables us to do is a researcher like Dr. Miller will come up and say, gee, I'm interested in these stem cells may be helpful in eye disease. And we simply shoot an email to 500,000 moms and 500,000 dads and saying, raise your hand if you have a child with an eye disease. And then a study can be put together. But it requires that collaboration. It requires that communication. And I have to say that Cheris is in her group has been really a spark plug and a motivator from a patient advocacy standpoint. Thank you. Now, how did you get involved in this? I mean, you did not start your career saying, I want to create a nonprofit to help bank children's stem cells. Right. Um, I actually come from a pretty uh, extensive pharmaceutical background, mm -hmm. and uh, my husband and I were blessed late in life with a baby, and we decided to bank his cord blood, but I had no idea why we were doing it. And um, through happenstance, I had an opportunity to meet Tom, and uh, in conversation he told me about how cord blood is now being used as a medical resource for many, many diseases, and then also the regenerative aspect of it. And it really caught my attention. And the more I thought about it, the more I wanted to be part of it. And I think really as humans, as women, um, we really own this whole concept of saving cord blood um, to be used in the future. So I was just very interested and I wanted to know more. And so um, as time went on, I started to realize there weren't any real advocacy groups out there that were truly non-commercial and biased and factual, so um, that's when Save the Cord Foundation was created. And um, so we're a 501c3 and very proud to work with Dr. Miller as our medical director. And then great to work with Tom, too, um, in Tucson. So uh, actually, some time ago, it's always kind of been my dream to have a collection program in Tucson, and we didn't have one. And in talking to Tom, he came up with the idea one day for the Newborn Possibilities Program. And after three years, um, 1,200 children who are at risk for uh, neurological deficit that could progress on to cerebral palsy, their cords were banked for free in the attempt that down the road they may need a transfusion. And with all, the, all that's going forward with the regenerative medicine, um, it's definitely a very powerful future therapy that's being used right now. Cool. And Dr. Miller, I mean, at the end of the day, everything that we do, every question comes back to the patient. Because without, without the benefit to the patient, all the other stuff we do is just an academic exercise, right? Well, sometimes it's great for the mouse, but, <laughs> but, but we're trying to treat people. Um, there, there's a couple of things that, that I've learned from this interaction. And the first one is being around people of passion is infectious. And I, I'm certain that everybody that's in this room is here because you're passionate about what your pursuit is. And it, 
it just feeds on itself. Uh, Cheris started her organization some years ago and regularly would keep me informed about what she was doing, but I never saw the need or the potential to involve our research program with her efforts until I finally got fed up with seeing children in the clinic that I really had no option to offer treatment for. And for about the last 10 years, I had been saying, I think we're going to be able to do something for you when stem cell therapy starts to take off and we're able to offer regenerative medicine on a regular basis. And finally one day I heard myself saying what I was saying and realized that the only way that I was going to be able to make an impact was if I put my actions behind my words and tried to find a way to collaborate and make this happen. What happened as a result was that early stem cell work was largely going on in unregulated environments, in uh, places where the research was being conducted in a, in a very ad hoc way. Great amounts of hope were being generated, great amounts of reports of progress were being made, and most of the scientific community held a great deal of skepticism. And I found myself trying to find the balance between the hope that I see marketed and the reality of what it is to measure the vision of a child who's very, very young and not able to actually read the eye chart. We're talking about trying to measure progress in vision as a result of a therapy in a child that's under one year of age. And so what this opportunity was for me was a way to address the question, are these interventions that are being used with stem cell cord blood actually demonstrating benefits to children's vision. Because most of these problems that they're receiving therapies for have global problems associated with their development. The children often are premature, the children are often developmentally delayed, and the visual system comprises a very large part of brain function. Once we started looking at this, it looked like the visual system may be a very good marker for what progress is occurring globally in these children that receive stem cell transplant or stem cell um, transfusion. And as a result, started working in the area and asked Cheris for the introduction and gets back to passion. You know, I don't know, Tom, why or how you took the time, but he, he made an afternoon available to take our lab team through his facility and he spent about an hour talking with my research group and myself and invested of himself an hour or two of his time to try and bring us up to date as to why there was a potential here. So if I have one message, it's be aware of the fact that there are people with passion and the second is take a risk and, and spend some of that passion on bringing someone else into the community. I, I can't thank you enough for, I know you're a busy guy, but to, to take a, a whole lab team through your facility and show us the potential was an amazing investment on your part that I hope will pay off in the long run. And the other thing that I've learned from this that I just would like to comment on for those of you who start to work with academic guys is if you've dealt with patient advocates in the past, I think that what you're going to find is, I'm a little bit leaning back here and, and asking, show me the evidence. Everybody wants hope, but when you're in the process of trying to deliver care, you're forced with trying to modulate the hope with the realistic expectation of a benefit. So you may find that when you start investing time dealing with scientists that we try and sell this idea of equipoise. Let's see if there's evidence that this actually works. And have patience with us when we start to act a little bit slow to move because we're not going to be moving at the same pace as the patient advocates are. And we're certainly not moving at the same pace that the investment bankers are. But we have the same hopes and the same goals in terms of progress and outcome. Okay. I think, you know, it's funny, we had a conference call 
And, and you know, it's a global business. I, I'm not sure what corner of the world you were in, Tom, but he was <laughs> definitely roaming. Um, but during that call, we talked about you know, some of the questions and, and how we would go forward. And we were talking about progress. And all of a sudden, I totally lost control of that call. And the three of you were just, oh, this is so fabulous, because we can talk about how we work together on this program, and we can talk about how we work together on this program. But what came out of it, and I think, um, Dr. Miller, you said it best when you said, you know, it was, it was the glue. All of a sudden, this all clicked together, yeah. and we were coming up with new ideas, and we were spurring new ways to get things done and, and provide the outreach and find the patients and to, to move the science forward. Yeah. And um, it's, it's always hard to replicate that. But I think, Tom, you know, when we look at progress, you know, how many diseases are there today that we are already applying stem cell therapies to? Right. So when my daughter, Wendy, came with that article out of Scientific America magazine, we were treating two diseases. Um, one was blood disease, the other was a cancer. And today there are 83 diseases and we're using it for regenerative medicine as well. So it's over the past, and that was in 1995, so it's, it's changed dramatically over that period of time. But here within the past five years alone, the regenerative medicine has just exploded. And I think it's, um, you know, we're releasing now about five to seven transplants every month. And we expect that number to double here within the next year or so. So it's pretty exciting. It's what I refer to as a bonus business because it helps kids. <laughs> And one of the things my passion is about it is when you do this with your daughter, you know, it's really kind of special. And we have a big give back part of the company, and that's what we did at the uh, University Medical Center or at the at TMC. And we've moved that program now into 3,500 hospitals throughout the United States where we provide free to those families if they have a child that is uh, qualifies under the newborn possibilities program. So we, we're trying to capture a number of those, but one of the things that excited me about what Joe's study is doing is the ability to, one of the things we found is that the sooner you can infuse a child after he's been identified as having like cerebral palsy or an infant stroke, typically happens when he's not meeting developmental milestones at probably month 12 to 18. What Joe's technology can do is, in some cases, we're hoping be able to identify these children at maybe three months of age or four months of age. And so sooner is better. And that's going to have a tremendous impact on these kids. So instead of walking with a limp, maybe they don't have a limp any longer. Um, but they're out of a wheelchair. So those are the exciting things that come out of collaboration and possibility thinking, and that's what excites me. So, you know, Sharers, you and I had lunch with some friends last week who oh, were amazing. dealing with hearing loss, right? right? And when I had my children, um, and my son Christopher was here earlier, some of you saw him, he was 23, and it was just starting then. And I was in California, I didn't know about CBR. And I wish I did, because now he has Crohn's disease and we may have therapy for Crohn's disease coming down the pipe, and I didn't bank his cord. And you, know, you and I have talked about what percentage of umbilical cord stem cells are being banked today? Um, currently we have uh, four million births in the U.S. every year, and less than 5% of all umbilical cord blood is saved, either publicly banked or, excuse me, publicly donated or privately banked. The other 95% is thrown away as medical waste. So it's really a tragedy. And um, this is the first year that the foundation has, the foundation has always um, made it a priority, obviously, to focus on expectant parents because we felt like um, they really needed to be aware of their options and be educated so they could make their own informed decision. 
But we also feel like this is part of an uh, education process that also belongs to the general public. And so this year, I'm really proud to say that we're going to be starting an, a statewide education program that will really help to fortify this information and really make it a standard of education and hopefully healthcare too. So I think that, um, you know, on so many different levels, it's so important to get the word out. Um, and I wanted to comment on this relationship. This is a very powerful triad, and it's, uh, Tom and I have been working together now for several years with Dr. Miller coming on board. Um, it's unique in that we have a lot of the components, I think, that are quintessential. We have a great deal of trust. We have great, um, we have the ability to be very agile if something changes, just like today. Mm -hmm. We're able to go to plan B or plan C. We have great communication, and we're very transparent with one another. But a, uh, on top of all of that, there's great integrity, and it's all wrapped up with passion. Mm -hmm. So it's really a great fit. It's a comfortable fit, it's a natural fit, and it's a powerful fit, and I'm excited about going forward. So, Dr. Miller, you know, in addition to the work that you do in the clinic and with patients, you're also with the University of Arizona College of Medicine. Yes, I'm a faculty member at the College of Medicine, and I've been there for 22 years. My my background is as an engineer prior to medical school, and uh, most of our work is in the study of visual development of children, trying to identify what it is about eyeglasses that uh, needs to be instituted at what age so that when the child grows up they see as well as possible. I had the benefit of working with an outstanding researcher who uh, uh, was the, the leading figure for measuring infant vision. And uh, she, she died three years ago from ALS, which is one of these diseases that I have every hope regenerative medicine would someday prevent the death for individuals with that problem. You know, um, th the closest I can come to how I feel about where we are in medicine right now may go back to the 1860s when general anesthesia was first introduced. Mm -hmm and surgery was able to be performed in, a, in an effective manner because people could survive the surgery. We're, we're at that point in medicine right now where we're going to see hugely transformative options for treatment being offered. And it's so exciting that, that I have an opportunity through the University of Arizona and through our state to be part of this. And, and when you get back to where we are, it really is an exciting time to be in Arizona, especially when there's businesses like Tom's and people like Cheris to work with. Yeah. I think, you know, as we look at how these collaborations come together, you know, I know, Tom, you've done some amazing things in developing your team at CBR and mm -hmm. growing them over time. And, and I'm going to put Kristen in this spot, but Kristen, stand up. I know you're there. I can see you just beyond the lights. So Kristen is the lab manager at CBR. You can sit down now. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it, it, when we did the tour and we had everybody out there, Tom, you shared with me how proud you were of Kristen and how she has developed and grown that team. You want to share some of that? Sure. I'm, I'm happy to talk about Kristen. Well, I'll really <laughs> embarrass her. <laughs> But I took a big risk on Kristen, so she was about 27 years old and had never managed more than three or four people. And, but she had the passion, and she's smart, and she had the drive. And so I tapped her on the shoulder and said, how would you like to run 100 people? And she kind of gulped and it was the best decision I ever made. She has stepped up to the bar every single time. She's amazing. <laughs> Thank you for letting me recognize her. <laughs> well, I, I know how proud you are about, of, of that and of all of your team, not just Kristen. Right. And, you know, it's really, you know, interesting when, when um, you know, your, your team talks about the research and sending samples out and the fact that, you know, thank goodness we have them. 
But mm. every time we send that sample out, it's because a child's sick. Yeah. And you can't be happy that a child's sick, but you can pray that you can make difference. Yeah. And we are starting to see that. So from a medical education perspective, Dr. Miller, um, and I know, and I can't, it, it's really hard for me to see across the lights that if Dr. Shapiro is still in the room, because I know Dr. Joan Rankin Shapiro from the College of Medicine Phoenix um, was, has been with us for most of the day also. But how do we educate the next generation of doctors and our current generation of doctors on how these therapies can help and the importance of communicating with patients across the spectrum? When we met with um, you know, some friends that, that had hearing, genetic hearing loss in their families, and the first thing that we said is, you know, make sure everybody in your family is saving the cord because we may have some things that will help. How do we teach doctors to share that message? I, I would argue that in the last 20 years, um, that question would have been completely addressed differently than today. With the internet and with the communication mechanisms that are available nowadays, I think that more often than not, patient advocacy groups mm -hmm are responsible for creating the awareness. Google is responsible for directed education. And then the families come in with questions that if you're not on your toes, you look like a fool when they ask the question and they know more about the answer than you do. And so the medical education system is now running in place to keep up with the new paradigm of just-in-time education. And medical students nowadays have changed their entire thought process from reading textbooks and trying to memorize as much information as possible to knowing how to acquire and process information quickly and on the fly. So we're, we're going through a huge transformation in the way we think and in the way we educate medical students and it's largely driven by the availability to index and access information as quickly as we can. I think the, the way the question will be answered in 20 years will look nothing like the way it's being answered today, and it certainly looks like nothing that I experienced when I went to medical school 30 years ago. Great. Okay. Charis, do you have something that you would layer on top of that as far as reaching the, especially the physician community that's in place today. Right, right. Well, um, as Dr. Miller said, I think these are changing times and I think physicians are being a lot more open-minded about new therapies. And for a while there was a lot of skepticism in the medical community. And then I think there was also a lot of confusion between uh, embryonic and the uncontroversial stem cells like umbilical cord blood. But I think we're seeing a real change right now, and um, especially in the population. When I first started the foundation, the minute I'd mention stem cells, people would back mm -hmm. up and get stiff, and I would say, oh, no, 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 it's not embryonic, it's this, and now, oops, oops, sorry. <laughs> now, oops, I'm you seeing um, people that want to know. They come up, they're interested, they want to embrace it, they want to own it, they want to find out more about it, just like I did. Um, so I think that's exciting. I think that, um, you know, um, I think that the future is going to be absolutely amazing where we're going to go with these stem cells, the things we're going to see. And I look at the analogy like Dr. Miller was talking about. Um, I can remember as a child getting a polio vaccine. Well, my daughter, who's 22, has no idea what polio is. That whole generation never had to suffer that horrible disease. And um, I hope the same thing happens with these stem cells, that in the future, perhaps we can create a, a, a landscape of, you know, not dying from cancer, not having diabetes, being able to um, uh, revitalize one's vision or perhaps grow new bones and tissue or whatever it is. So um, I'm just really excited about it. and. Um, I just think it's, it's definitely the future's here and we need to embrace it. Tom, when, when we talk about the progress that this creates for companies as the leader of a company, what would be some of the um, things that you would share with your fellow leaders about how do you build these relationships with your patient advocacy groups and do the outreach? I mean, how do you start? Um, so I'm a big one on organic growth. Um, and it's, it's finding people that are like-minded in terms of the passion. And it's, um, 
Cheris really was the one that brought Joe Miller and, and myself together. And it was her spark plug that made it happen. Um, but then it kind of morphs, and now Joe's a spark plug. And one of the things that excited me about it when Joe came in was that we were seeing children that were treated for cerebral palsy that have had brain injury. And many times that also impacts sight. And we'd see they'd be treated for cerebral palsy, but also their sight improved. And I said, uh huh. Maybe there is something there that makes sense. So let's do a study to prove it in or prove it out. But so you start to connect the dots, and so it happens organically. You don't. You never thought of regenerative medicine when you were thinking of treating cancer, but all of a sudden, you see a child that was treated for cancer that also had cerebral palsy, and his cerebral palsy is improved. And so they kind of mm -hmm. run off of one another. So I, I go on to organic growth is key, passion is key, and like-minded people within your organization, as you grow it, don't lose your culture. Because it's very easy when you have five people to have like-mindedness. But when you grow to be 300 or 400 or 500, you can lose that culture as you grow rapidly. So culture is key. I know Matt Likens is out there somewhere. I know Stacy is. I think we'll have to bring you back to talk about that one sometime because I know that we have a number of fast growing companies here in Arizona. And the, the CEOs have been getting together and talking about it and we all agree that it is the culture more than anything else that's going to yeah. make or break you. So that's a, a perfect thing, and you know, maybe that's in our DNA. I mean, we, we joke about it and say that we have a collaborative gene here, mm -hmm. but I wonder if it's not in our DNA that's running through those stem cells that says, you know, we know how to work together here, we know how to create a culture of collaboration, and who knows if we embrace the possibilities, what will come next. Mm -hmm. So to our panelists, thank you very much for an incredibly inspiring half hour. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, what do you say?